On November 11, 2020, a Cessna Cardinal was cruising over Washington State on what should have been a routine instructional flight. The weather was not extreme, the aircraft was not unusual, and the people on board were not inexperienced. This was a standard general aviation flight, conducted under visual conditions, in an airplane that thousands of pilots fly every day. Yet, just a short time later, that same airplane would stall, spin, and crash into trees only a few hundred feet from a runway. Both people on board would lose their lives. So how does a flight go from routine to unrecoverable without a dramatic failure, without a sudden emergency, and without an obvious warning? To understand that, we need to slow the story down and look carefully at two things. What the airplane was doing in the sky and what the engine was quietly doing inside, long before anyone realized how serious the situation had become. The aircraft involved was a Cessna 177B Cardinal powered by a Lycoming O360 engine. Unlike many newer training aircraft, this engine uses a carburetor rather than fuel injection, a detail that will become very important later. On board were two pilots on an instructional Part 91 flight. Nothing about the setup suggested urgency. This was training, not a rushed trip, and not a challenging mission. The flight departed from Bellingham International Airport and climbed normally to around 6,500 feet. At this point, everything appeared routine. The airplane was established in cruise, and there was no indication of an immediate problem. But when investigators later looked at radar and performance data, a subtle pattern emerged. Over the next 16 minutes, the airplane's ground speed began to slowly decrease. At the same time, altitude was being lost. Not abruptly, but gradually. This is an important moment in the story because nothing dramatic is happening here. There is no sudden engine failure, no loud bang, no immediate emergency. Instead, performance is quietly slipping away. Eventually, the instructor contacts air traffic control and declares an emergency. The message is short, calm, and telling. They have full power selected, but they are losing the engine and cannot maintain altitude. Think about that statement for a moment. Full power is set, yet the airplane is descending. That combination immediately tells us this is not a normal engine failure. Something is limiting the engine's ability to produce power, even though the throttle is fully forward. A TC asks a key question, one that many pilots listening will immediately recognize. Carb heat? The answer comes back without hesitation. Affirmative. And that is where this accident becomes more complex than it might first appear. Because at this point, the crew has identified a likely problem and taken the textbook corrective action. Yet the situation continues to deteriorate. This is not a sudden loss of power. It is a confusing progressive loss of performance. The kind that gives pilots just enough hope that the engine might recover while quietly reducing the margins that keep an airplane flying. When pilots hear the term carburetor icing, many instinctively think of cold winter conditions. Snow, frost, visible ice. But carburetor icing does not work that way. In fact, some of the most dangerous carb icing conditions occur when the weather feels relatively mild. Here's why. Inside a carburetor, air speeds up as it passes through a narrowed section called the venturi. When air speeds up, pressure drops. At the same time, fuel is sprayed into that airflow and fuel evaporation absorbs heat. The result is a significant temperature drop inside the carburetor, often 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, lower than the outside air. That means ice can form inside the engine even when the outside temperature is well above freezing. On this day, the weather was nearly perfect for that to happen. The temperature was around 6 degrees Celsius, with a dew point close to 2 degrees. That small temperature dew point spread indicates high humidity, exactly the environment where carb ice can form quickly and persistently. Data recovered by investigators shows that carburetor temperatures on this flight plunged to as low as 17 degrees Fahrenheit. As that happened, fuel flow dropped, exhaust gas temperatures fell, and engine performance degraded further. Now this is where an important misconception needs to be addressed. Carburetor heat being on does not guarantee that power will come back. Applying carb heat introduces warmer, 
less dense air into the engine. That air can melt ice, but it also initially reduces engine power. As ice begins to melt, the engine may run rough as water passes through the cylinders. To a pilot, that roughness can feel like the problem is getting worse, not better. If ice buildup is already significant, it can take a long time for heat to clear it. And in some cases, especially at high power settings or low airflow, carb heat may never fully restore the engine's ability to produce rated power. This helps explain something that might otherwise seem contradictory. The crew reported full power selected, carb heat applied, and yet the engine continued to lose performance. Because throttle position does not equal horsepower. What matters is how much air the engine can breathe, how much fuel it can burn, and whether ice is quietly choking that process. By the time this flight was turning back toward a nearby airfield, the engine was no longer simply weak. It was unreliable. And that distinction would shape every decision that followed. With the emergency declared, the crew turns the airplane toward Whidbey Air Park. On a map, it looks close. Reassuringly close. Close enough that it's easy to believe the situation might still resolve itself. But the data shows that as the aircraft heads in that direction, its track becomes less stable. Small heading changes appear. Altitude continues to decrease. And importantly, there is no sign of a meaningful recovery in engine performance. At this point, a natural question arises. If the airplane was descending toward warmer, denser air, why didn't the engine come back? The answer lies in how carburetor icing behaves once it becomes established. Carb heat relies on airflow to transfer warmth into the induction system. As power decreases and airspeed falls, that airflow is reduced. Less airflow means less heat where it's needed most. At the same time, melting ice does not simply disappear, it turns into water which enters the cylinders and disrupts combustion. That can cause misfiring and rough running even as ice is being removed. To a crew under pressure, this can feel like an engine that is refusing to cooperate. There is also another subtle effect at play. Power changes during low altitude maneuvering can allow carb ice to reform quickly if heat application is interrupted or reduced, even briefly. In other words, the engine can appear to improve slightly then deteriorate again without much warning. By the time the airplane is maneuvering near the air park, the engine is no longer something the crew can rely on. It may produce moments of thrust, but it cannot be trusted to do so consistently. And this is an important shift in how the situation needs to be managed. From here on, this flight is no longer about fixing the engine. It's about managing energy, airspeed, altitude, and options, with the assumption that the engine may not help when it's needed most. Whidbey Air Park is not a large, forgiving runway. It is relatively short, narrow, and closely surrounded by trees. In calm conditions, with a healthy engine, it's manageable. With a failing engine, the margin for error becomes very small. This is where a critical distinction matters. Reachable does not always mean landable. An airfield can be within gliding distance, and still require precise energy management to use safely. Overshoot slightly, and obstacles loom. Undershoot, and there may be no room to recover. The Cessna 177B Cardinal also brings its own characteristics into this situation. Compared to a Cessna 172, the Cardinal has a cleaner airframe and a stabilator rather than a conventional elevator. This makes pitch response more sensitive, particularly at low speeds. The stall brake can also be less forgiving, offering less aerodynamic warning as margins disappear. Witnesses near the air park described an airplane with no engine sound, a propeller that was not turning, and noticeable pitch oscillations, a porpoising motion as the crew tried to manage descent and alignment. These pitch changes are significant. They suggest a crew working hard to stretch glide distance, adjust aim point, and keep the airplane flying all while operating close to the minimum speed required to maintain lift. Every small pitch correction trades airspeed for altitude or vice versa. And when energy is already limited, those trades become increasingly costly. This is not a case of reckless maneuvering. It is the picture of an airplane operating at the very edge of its performance envelope, with diminishing options and little room to absorb mistakes. 
Radar data indicates that the airplane was only about 300 feet above the runway during its final moments. Witnesses then saw the left wing drop, followed by a spin toward the trees just west of the airstrip. There was no altitude available for recovery. The National Transportation Safety Board concluded that the probable cause of the accident was a failure to maintain adequate airspeed, leading to an aerodynamic stall and spin during the emergency landing attempt. The loss of engine power due to carburetor icing was identified as a contributing factor. It's important to pause here and reframe what that actually means. This was not a reckless maneuver. It was not an aggressive turn. And it was not a simple pilot mistake in the everyday sense of the phrase. This was an energy-starved airplane at low altitude with a degraded engine attempting to reach a constrained landing area. In that environment, airspeed becomes both critical and fragile. A small yaw, a slight pitch increase, or an attempt to stretch the glide just a little further can be enough to exceed the wing's remaining margin. This accident leaves us with several lessons that extend far beyond this single flight. Carbureted engines, while reliable, demand respect and understanding. Carburetor icing is not a winter problem. It is a humidity and airflow problem, and it can quietly take away performance even when procedures are followed. Instructional flights do not eliminate risk. Instructors, like all pilots, operate under workload, time pressure, and uncertainty. Training environments can still become complex very quickly when systems degrade, and perhaps most importantly, energy management always comes first. When an engine becomes unreliable, Preserving airspeed and keeping options open matters more than reaching any specific point on the ground. This accident reminds us that aviation rarely punishes one dramatic error. More often, it punishes small misunderstandings that align at exactly the wrong moment, when margins are thin and time is short. Understanding those moments is how we encourage safer outcomes in the future.